But let's move on now with our next guests. Stay in the theme of creation, creation towards regeneration. And for that, we need to unleash human potential. We need to unleash human creativity. Not just with those who, can, who are artists, but actually everyone can be creative. And I think that our first guest, John Hagel, is John around? Can you find him, Scott? Yes, I'm John here. Has his audio. He's right there. I'm here. That's great, John. Thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. John is a co-chairman of the Deloitte Center for the Edge, based at the Silicon Valley. Um, John, uh, I have heard him speak several times, and every time I hear him speak, I feel that what he says resonates very much with what we think at the World Human Forum. It is about unleashing human potential. And uh, I remember once recently, actually, John, you said something, we shouldn't worry about how to feed seven or eight billion people. We should worry about how to unleash their potential. So I'm very happy to have you here and uh, I'm giving you the, the floor. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be able to uh, contribute to this amazing gathering. So, and the topic is certainly dear to my heart. Unleashing creativity is something that I view as essential uh, for us all to flourish. And so I've spent a lot of time trying to uh, understand what, what's required and what the possibilities are. I'd say one of the um, resistance points I run into when I talk about unleashing creativity is many people will tell me, well, come on, John, some of us are capable of being creative, but most of us just want to be told what to do and have the safety and security of an income, and that's all they, they are capable of. And uh, my response to that is, if you really believe that, let's go to a playground and look at children six or seven years old. Show me one that doesn't have curiosity, imagination, creativity. We all had it. What happened? We went to school. And our schools are designed, I'm going to generalize here, but I've done enough historical study to know at least in the US, our school systems were explicitly designed to take children who were very uh, curious and just wandering and help them to focus and really follow instructions and deliver reliably and efficiently. And then we went from school to uh, organizations that required that from all the people participating in the organization. So the schools were doing their job of training us for the institutions we have. My view is that we are in the early stages of a big shift, um, something that is transforming the global economy. There are many dimensions of that big shift, but one dimension is the need to rethink our institutions at a fundamental level. I would say again, as a generalization, our institutions today are and around the world and all institutions, not just companies, governments, uh, you know, schools, uh, all institutions are organized around a model of what I call scalable efficiency. It's all about executing tasks highly, reliably, and efficiently at scale. Our belief is in this big shift world, that scalable efficiency model is increasingly broken. It's actually not delivering efficiency, it's delivering inefficiency and that in this new world, we're going to have to cultivate a whole different set of institutions around a model of what we call scalable learning. And I hasten to say, when I talk about scalable learning in this context, I'm not talking about training programs. That's sharing existing knowledge. The learning that is most important and valuable in a world that's rapidly changing, like ours, is learning in the form of creating new knowledge through action and doing it together. Because no matter how smart any of us are as individuals, we're gonna be, learn a lot faster through action by acting together. 
And that's a fundamentally different model for all of our institutions, but I believe absolutely essential if we're going to really um, bring out the creativity that all of us have. It has many different dimensions to it. I mean, one dimension is redefining work in all of our institutions. Again, I'm gonna generalize, but work in most large institutions today is tightly specified, highly standardized routine tasks. Our view is that work increasingly is gonna be taken by technology, by artificial intelligence, by robots, and that is wonderful because that is work that we as humans should never have been doing to begin with. And it frees up capacity of us as humans to do the work that we really are uniquely equipped to do, which is to address unseen problems and opportunities to create more value in whatever context we're in. And that's about creativity, unleashing that creativity. The problem is today in most work environments, we don't have no time to even see the problems or opportunities because we've got so many tasks that are consuming all our attention. Not just see the opportunities and problems, but address them and create the value. That's the big opportunity in redefining work, but it's a fundamental shift. And I would say that, um, I'll just quickly also add that there's a fundamental shift in leadership. In the scalable efficiency institutions we've had, the mark of a strong leader is someone who has an answer to all the questions. No matter what question, you can count on the leader to have an answer. Our view in the scalable learning institutions is the mark of a strong leader is someone who has the most powerful questions and who will freely admit they don't have an answer and ask for help. Can you imagine the culture that that creates where it's not only okay, but expected to ask questions and to ask for help? In a scalable efficiency world, that's a mark of weakness. You have a question? Go back and read the manual. You're asking for help? You're a weakling. No, in a world where we need to learn faster together, it's the questions that count and we're gonna need help in addressing those questions. And it can inspire people to come together to address really exciting questions and come up with answers that nobody's had before. So I think that there's a significant challenge. I mean, I'm talking about this big shift from scalable efficiency to scalable learning. This is not gonna be an easy transition. And one thing I warn everybody against is the power of the immune system that exists in every large organization and that will mobilize immediately to crush any efforts to change. So never ever underestimate the power of the immune system. But on the other side, I think that unleashing creativity is essential. The challenges are big, but the rewards are enormous. And that ultimately to help all of us achieve more of our potential as individuals, as society and as a planet, we need to unleash creativity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will certainly come back to you with different questions, um, but I would like to ask you a more personal question here because uh, I'm gonna ask uh, the same question to our next guests and um, I would like to hear your answer. What made you reach that conclusion? What's your story? Where are you coming from that at some point you say, okay, you know, I'm not going to stay in my box because obviously you came out of a school, of a university, you were probably at some point in that box too. What made you unleash your creativity and speak today as you do? It was a long journey. In fact, I'm actually writing a book about that journey, and it has to do with another dimension of the work that I've been doing, which is increasingly focusing on emotions uh, and, uh, and looking within and, and understanding the emotions that are shaping our actions, driving our, our choices. And I, without going into the whole, whole journey, I, I had a childhood, I'm sorry? We will wait for your book. Yes, <laughs> but 
but I, I started my journey as a child with a, a profound fear. I was in a very dysfunctional family. I was uh, exposed to enormous anger and I was very afraid. But from the earliest days, the, the one thing that uh, kept me going, e even in that environment, was I became a big fan of science fiction. And in those days, science fiction was all about opportunity in the future. It was all about the amazing future ahead of us. And that got me inspired. That had me filled with hope that there was something beyond this fear. And then over, over time, I ended up finding ways to address the fear and overcome it and become focused on ways to create more value for others. And that was, um, I'm very grateful that I've had that uh, ability to do that. Thank you. Obviously, the journey for each of us can be different. Sometimes it's a personal journey. Sometimes it's helped through education, like we heard yesterday in our amazing speakers yesterday afternoon. Sometimes society helps uh, by organizing systems that uh, can push you in that direction. And uh, I want to look for Thomas Bjorkman now. Uh, Thomas Bjorkman should be there, Scott. Yes, but, uh, I'm, I'm here. I can please. hear you, Alexandra. Okay, I'm glad to have you here in Ludwigsburg. Usually we have you in Delphi. Uh, obviously, John, we hope to have you in Delphi too, maybe next year, because if there's one place where people knew that they had to ask questions, then that was the, De that was the Delphi Oracle they were going for. Uh, but Thomas uh, is an uh, um, applied philosopher, a social entrepreneur, but uh, we know each other now for two years. He came to see us in Delphi at the very early days of the World Human Forum. Um, and I, maybe I'll ask you, Thomas, to start with your personal story, uh, because I know that you come from a very different type of business initially. Yes. So... Uh... I think uh, I have a bit the same background as, as John. I also come from uh, the corporate world in, in many respects. I was in investment banking for, for many years, but had the opportunity to leave investment banking almost exactly 10 years ago to set up my own foundation in Stockholm, the Oak Island Foundation, e Credit Foundation, uh, where we are looking at the relationship and interdependence between our own personal inner development and societal change. And of course, in, in these turbulent times right now, and John again was referring to that we are in a transition time, and I definitely think that we are deep in a transition time. Uh, in those moments in history, personal inner growth and development becomes even more essential. Thank you, Thomas, but uh, maybe you can continue and tell us a little bit about your experience that you so well uh, present in, in the Nordic Secret to yeah. show how at some point of history, uh, society being organized differently can help many people go in the right direction. Yes, thank, thank you. And I want to try to share my screen for this. So I have a few slides so let's, let's ask see. Scott for that yeah I think it's working let me see so uh, is this working yeah okay so uh, first of all thank you very much for, for giving me the opportunity to uh, participate in this uh, beautiful virtual festival and I'm very happy to see so many familiar faces from Delphi and also so many new faces. So um, uh, I just want to start by uh, showing a picture of the Oak Island outside uh, Stockholm. Here is where my foundation is located and we use this island as a, use nature on this island as a catalyst for both inner growth and development, and also group processes. Uh, you were so kind to um, uh, mention my book, The Nordic Secret, 
um, which I wrote, uh, I think it's three years ago now, together with my friend and colleague, uh, philosopher and author Lena Anderson from, uh, from Denmark. Um, as you might notice on the cover of the Nordic Secret, we have a photo of uh, Goethe and Schiller. And Jochen mentioned earlier that uh, I was going to mention uh, Schiller. And uh, as Jochen said, Schiller was born in Marbach, just eight kilometers away from Ludwigsburg. And he and Goethe and quite a few of the idealist uh, German philosophers that were writing er er in the beginning of the 1800s, they all reacted against the Enlightenment philosophers' view of our mind as a rational machine. They said our mind is not at all a rational machine. Our mind is an organic system that continues to develop throughout life. And that development of our mind or of our consciousness, they used a German word, Bildung to describe. And unfortunately, this German term of Bildung does not have uh, an English translation. It's something like realizing a, a hidden potential. And what Goethe and Schiller was stressing is that this realization of our inner potential for consciousness development is something that can be supported and also should be supported by culture and society. And that this development is not only good for us as individuals, but even perhaps more important for the development of society. So um, I'm going to tell you now how these ideas of Goethe and Schiller and Herder and von Humboldt and Hegel uh, all came to influence the Scandinavian societies in a very, very profound way. And first of all, it's important to remember that at the end of the 1800s, all the Scandinavian countries were amongst the poorest non-democratic agrarian societies in Europe. Uh, a large part of the population were seeing such hardship that during the last decades of the 1800s, up to 30% of the working population in Sweden emigrated mainly to the US. But then just a few generations later, even before the Second World War, all the Nordic countries were at the top of the richest, most stable industrial nations in the world. And the question is, what made this transition possible? And this is really the Nordic secret. And the secret is that back then, in the end of the 1800s, we had very visionary intellectuals and politicians who knew that in times of rapid development and transition, and they could certainly see society changing. They all could see industrialization and urbanization coming. It was really going from a pre-modern society into a modern society. In those turbulent times, it's just so easy for us humans to want to find an outside authority to hold on to to hold on to a dogmatic religion or an authoritarian leader. But these politicians, they didn't want to be authoritarian leaders. They were firmly committed to building democracy and they knew that the only way to build stable democracies is from bottom up. So they wanted to create a large number of what we today might call conscious co-creators that could help co-create modernity. And in order to be able to be those conscious co-creators, they wanted to facilitate human growth 
and inner maturation. And these ideas they got from Goethe and Schiller. So they actually instigated a large scale program in all the Nordic countries for inner maturation, inner growth or consciousness development. And the way they did that is quite extraordinary. What they did was that they created retreat centers. They started in Denmark, um, moved on to Norway and then to Sweden and grow very rapidly during the last decades of the 1800s. And by the year 1900, there were actually a hundred retreat centers like this, just in Denmark, 75 in Norway and 150 in Sweden, where young adults in their twenties, later on with full state subsidy, could spend up to six months in retreat with the expressed aim of becoming so grounded in themselves that they could actually hold the complexity of societal transition and function as co-creators. And this is what it could look like in the beginning. It was fairly small centers with 20, 30, 40 participants, often out in nature and part from being a center for individual growth and maturation, there was also a program to understand the new technology coming in and understanding that technology could, as we just said, be both for good and bad, and that we consciously need to apply technology to build a good modernity, and also give the participants simple tools for participating in the civil society. How to start an organization, how to start a newspaper, how to give a speech, how to write an article. And when this program was at its height, almost exactly a hundred years ago, then 10% of each young generation participated in one of these six months retreats. And of course that created some sort of uh, critical mass. Specifically, since these 10% came from all different layers of society, actually a majority of the participants came from farming or working class background. For those that could not participate in the retreat, a concept of self-facilitating groups, study groups, were uh, invented and implemented. And of course, when we today are at, at what I believe is a similar societal transformation. This time, not from a pre-modern to a modern society, but from modernity to something completely new. What could we then learn from this in these times of crisis and with the corona crisis being just the last one in a series of crises? Well, to conclude, um, I don't think that we could or should use the Nordic secret as uh, a blueprint for what is needed today. But I certainly think that Goethe and Schiller was really onto something when they pointed out the importance of our inner world and our inner growth. And as this is something that we have really forgotten in today's society, rediscovering our possibility for inner growth can certainly be a key in this transition. So I don't see Nordic Secret as a blueprint, but more as a case study, actually showing that when we are talking about consciousness and consciousness development, these are not some new fancy ideas. The idea of broad scale consciousness development has actually been applied in three or four Nordic countries a hundred years ago, and it actually worked. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much, uh, because this links so much with what we try to create in Delphi through our Delphi Cube, connecting this inner transformation 
to education, to democracy, to regeneration uh, and sustainability. We literally believe that unless we integrate those elements, because they are interdependent and interconnected, unless we consciously say and explain to everybody, no point talking about education separately from this inner transformation, no point talking about democracy separately from education, and certainly no point talking about sustainability and regeneration separate from those other notions. And of course, technology and the arts are what completes our cube with the human at heart. Yeah. So and it could, it, could, it could also be, of course, the other way around. Th of that, course. that in order for us to be able to really take in the, the vastness of, for example, the environmental challenge that we are facing, we might actually need the inner growth first in order to not just feel completely overwhelmed and become defensive. So Absolutely. it's working in both ways, of course. So unleashing the human potential for re regeneration. And here I'm looking now for our third guest, uh, John Fullerton. Um, Scott, is John around? I'm here. Great, can I see you? Can you open your... Uh, ah, here you are. I see I'm, you now. Great. Yeah. Fantastic. John, I hey, thank you for being here with us. Indeed, um, unleashing creativity. Today, we need to do it towards something. And that is really a regenerative society. And um, I'm very happy that you're here with us. But I will start with you as with our other two guests with this more personal question about what brought you here where you are today. Sure. Well, my story, um, I'm sort of an unconventional uh, participant, maybe. I, I, like Thomas, came out of the banking world. Um, I'm quick to say that I left that world in 2001. Uh, so you can't blame the financial crisis and what was um, brought upon Greece by the by the bankers on me. But um, I've really been very much in the keeping with the, the the theme of Delphi. I've really been pursuing a question um, ever since then. Uh, so 20 years now, uh, the question began very personal. What what is it that I wanted to do with my life and my career? I had gotten kind of um, restless on Wall Street and, um, and took the opportunity to leave. And the first meeting, I took the summer off in 2001. And the first meeting I had was downtown, close to where I used to work. The first time I had been back in New York City since I left in the spring. And I had a meeting at 9.30 in the morning, which happened to be September 11th. So when I was uh, in the subway and, and about to, you know, at 9.10, the subway stopped and I got to the street the moment after the second plane hit. And so here I was sort of in this beginning of this search and then this very profound experience happened and pushed me into what I like to call sort of a deep think period. And I spent really much of the next 10 years dabbling with various projects, but really in a, in a, in a, in a period reading books and I discovered complexity science, system science. I discovered the environmental crisis. And um, I actually read, um, one of the things I read was limits to growth and the idea that exponential growth on a finite planet is in violation of the laws of physics. And as a finance person, that very quickly became clear to me that if that's true, then the economic system is the root cause of all of these other problems. The problems are really symptoms of this economic system. And if it's the economic system, then as a finance guy, I understood very clearly that it had to be people like me who think they're so smart driving the economic system toward exponential growth as our path to prosperity. And so it was really kind of a ex existential crisis, um, questioning my entire worldview on what truth was. And um, there weren't many people asking those questions back in, in that time. Today, those questions seem very um, very normal, other than to maybe some of our leading economists who are still in the pursuit of growth as a path to prosperity. Um, but I set out on a, on a journey to, to try to find answers to that question and um, launched a little think tank called Capital Institute in 2010, um, which is what I've been doing ever since. 
Okay, so what will be this new regenerated society? How do you see it? How, what can we dream together? What can we create? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful continuation of, of the theme of this entire conference, uh, including all of the speakers that have just spoken before me. I, I resonate strongly with, with uh, each and every one of them. And, and I, I only know Thomas. In fact, I'm privileged to have been to Oak Island on a Club of Rome event. Um, but, um, uh, but I now have two other, two other friends because we're clearly singing off the same song sheet. But um, for me, the, the, the aha moment was when I learned that a, there is something called living system science that explains how living systems actually work in the world. Uh, it is cutting edge science. It's not conventional physics and uh, biology. It's, it's uh, rooted in ecology and, and uh, is the study of how living systems are structured and designed and actually work. And you know, we all on this call are living systems. Our bodies are living systems. And the, the genius of a living system is that it, 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 it follows a process called regeneration. It's, we're regenerating at a cellular level as we sit here. And that's very profoundly different than this idea of sustainability. And so through some investment projects I was involved in and, and remain involved in that are in the regenerative agriculture space, I came on this idea that if there's such a thing as a regenerative process and it works in the context of agriculture, and agriculture is a living system. I kind of posited that, well, the human economy is also a living system. So why wouldn't those same patterns and principles that apply to regenerative agriculture also be po possibly apply to the human economy as a solution to the degenerative, unsustainable system that we have? And I'll, I'll just share a few slides um, myself that will kind of help with some pictures um, to, to illustrate some of this. See if I can do this. Um, there we go. Is that working? Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, John. Great. Beautiful. Um, so, um, um, you know, my work, it really culminated in a, in a long paper I wrote in 2015 called Regenerative Capitalism, how um, uh, how, how the uh, patterns and principles, uh, regenerative patterns and principles will shape our new economy. And, um, and, and what really struck me is that these living systems patterns and, and principles uh, are highly aligned with the wisdom traditions that have stood the test of time. In fact, a month after I published this paper, uh, the Pope's encyclical, Laudato Si, was published. And um, I really got, literally got goosebumps reading it because these principles I'll describe or show very briefly were, were appearing throughout that document. It's a beautiful document. But of course, that wisdom goes way back literally to uh, our indigenous elders. And if you translate living systems uh, into indigenous wisdom, you see a lot of the same themes emerging. So it struck me that both the indigenous wisdom that has stood the test of time and our understanding of living systems were in alignment and what was not in alignment was uh, our, our economics. And I'm having trouble making this go forward. Huh. Let me try that. There we go. So not to pick on one economist, but just to share with people something that is not well known uh, and how broken our economics really is. In 2018, uh, and and um, Thomas, I'm afraid I'm going to have to pick on Sweden here. The Swedish Central Bank awarded the Nobel Prize um, uh, in economics to an economist named William Nordhaus, who, um, whose model figured out that the optimal global warming uh, uh, target we should shoot for is three and a half degrees Celsius. Somehow, well knowing that the climate science has telling us that anything above one and a half degrees will invite disaster. And that won him the Nobel Prize. So it, it just gives you an idea of how lost and broken our economics thinking is and how siloed and not integrated, um, uh, the way Alexandra has been talking about, uh, the field of economics is. 
And so um, just for a, a quick definition, just to get us sort of level set, uh, we describe regenerative economics as the application of nature's laws and patterns of systemic health, self-organization, self-renewal, and regenerative vitality to socioeconomic systems. Um, a beautiful diagram that a colleague of mine, um, Bill Reed, has developed for the built environment, um, and this, um, you know, very relevant in, in the work James is doing, I believe can be extended to the entire economy. And, and the, the essence of this is that we're largely sitting over on the left with the modern age mechanistic design thinking, reductionist thinking, where we separate complexity into parts. And we're moving toward a green economy and the circular economy ideas, um, uh, ESG and the financial world. These are all trying to move us from the left toward sustainable. But a proper understanding of the regenerative paradigm is that regeneration, as I said earlier, is a process and sustainability is really an outcome of that process. In fact, I believe thriving is an outcome of that process and that the regenerative potential, and we've talked a lot about potential here this morning or this afternoon, um, emerges when we align our, our systems, in this case, our economic system, with the same patterns and principles that explain the emergent potential in all living systems, which includes life on this planet. Uh, you'll also note that there's a uh, relationship here or a connection to rising consciousness. As we move from the left to the right and from the lower left to the upper right, we're moving not only into a less material intense economy, but also a higher consciousness economy. And we're following holistic thinking and patterns of natural system design rather than uh, which, which is totally aligned with what Goethe said many, many years ago, rather than the mechanistic reductionist thinking of, of our modern age thinking. Um, one last picture. I mentioned earlier principles. I won't spend the time going through each of these, but, but maybe just touch on a couple. Um, uh, just going back to John's talk earlier and the, the, the power of individual potential, in living systems, um, all parts of the system are empowered to participate in the system or the, or the system won't realize its potential. So for example, my feet and my toes are empowered to participate, participate in the circulation of oxygen, not just because my body and my mind or whatever feel sorry for my toes so they give them a little bit of oxygen, but so that I can be healthy and fulfill my potential as a human being. Um, uh, another another um, uh, principle I might mention just briefly is this idea of right relationship. It's probably central to the health of all living systems and, uh, and the idea that everything is truly connected to everything. And if the, if the pandemic hasn't taught us that, then uh, shame on us. So in, in closing of, for my comments, I, I might just um, uh, share what I've learned recently, which is that the um, uh, the plague actually preceded and probably enabled the Renaissance to happen uh, and come to Italy. And I think, uh, and again, I share this with all of the other um, uh, speakers who came before me, I am convinced we're in a profound transformational period. I've been saying that for many years now and, and the evidence only gets stronger. Um, I think we're, like Thomas said, leaving the modern age. Uh, I had many, many great strengths and, and developed uh, humanity in, in great directions, but it's reached its limits. And the, the limitations of reductionist thinking are now um, uh, being felt everywhere. And so we need to move beyond this reductionism and get reconnect with the, um, the, the un an understanding of the whole. And some people are now calling this the integral age. And I personally believe given how broken our economy is and how damaged therefore our planet and our societies are, we're entering into what I'm gonna call the regenerative age, which is that we need to realign with the beauty and the genius and the, and the um, creativity uh, of life and humanity on this planet in order that we can then fulfill um, our real potential, which will happen in the integral age. And then maybe I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it resonates very much with what we heard yesterday morning from uh, Jeremy Land on the need to create yeah. ecological civilization, of course. And I would like to go back to John uh, and, and ask him uh, how, what his feelings are about this. Um, 
Can you comment on what uh, uh, the other John just said? You have to unmute. Had to unmute myself there. No, I, I think it's it's very inspiring, and I do think it's part of this fundamental transformation that we're going to have to uh, go through uh, in order to really thrive. I mean, I do think that um, thinking holistically, among other things, I'm on the board of a group called the Santa Fe Institute, and big fan of the notion of complex adaptive systems and and uh, avoiding reductionist. Uh, analysis and thinking, it gets us into so much trouble um, versus thinking holistically about the way all these parts interact with each other and how we can shape it in ways that will create much more value for everyone in the, in the system. Sorry, there is one thing I would like to say that resonates very much with us uh, at the World Human Forum, which is this idea about ancient knowledge whether it's indigenous or uh, ancestral, ancient Chinese, uh, Buddhist, Greek, um, we believe that what we need to do now is to combine those two intelligences, the ancestral intelligence with the artificial intelligence, because there are two AIs and we tend mm -hmm. to forget it. Mm -hmm. I think that if we succeed to do that, then uh, humanity will probably find wisdom. Because as we said earlier, uh, technology is absolutely needed uh, and uh, what we tend to forget is the second AI. Would anyone like to comment on that? Well, I, I, I'll, it, 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 I can jump in on that um, uh, briefly. I mean, I, I think the, the, there's tremendous dangers with any new technology and AI is probably exponentially more dangerous than social media, which was exponentially more dangerous than derivatives, which is where I caused the danger. Um, but, um, but for sure, we are going to need an intelligence system to be able to see and share and manage in a distributed way the way, um, I forget which of the prior speakers was talking about it, I, I think it was probably James, um, uh, collectively the critical um, uh, ecosystem uh, functioning variables of our planet. And that's never going to be managed top down hierarchically. It's going to be managed with a greater web of intelligence than, um, than existed previously. And isn't it amazing that the internet showed up just in time and now artificial intelligence is showing up just in time. So if we use these technologies correctly, um, which by the way, both of those technologies are potentially highly regenerative because they accelerate the circulation. You know, one of my principles I call robust circulation. So it's not just about energy and matter, it's about information and knowledge. And um, uh, I also didn't mention that we're trying to encourage, I wouldn't say we're putting it into practice, we're trying to serve the emergence of this regenerative economy through a network called the, the um, uh, Global Regenerative Communities Network and uh, as soon as James has one of his villages up, they'll, they'll be the, uh, the, the, star, the star member of this network. Um, but these, this is happening. Um, it's happening at a grassroots level. We, we're organizing this at a bioregional scale. And one of the things we talk about, there's now 15 of these initiatives around the world. There's not one yet in Greece, so there's an opportunity. Um, but what, one thing we often talk about and all the time and we're working on is how do we measure our progress from degenerative toward regenerative? And I believe AI will play a critical role in that. John, do you want to comment? Uh, no, I think it's, uh, it's uh, again, uh, very much connected to a lot of the work we've been doing. I talked about the big shift. One way we have of representing the big shift is we're moving from a world of stocks to a world of flows. And what we mean by that is stocks of knowledge. In the past, the key to success was developing some proprietary knowledge, protecting it, making sure nobody else could access it, and then delivering efficiently the value into the marketplace. Increasingly in this world, the key to success is how to participate more effectively in a broader range of more diverse knowledge flows so that we can learn faster together and that that's ultimately what's going to drive success in the future. But 
again, all our institutions are still driven by that knowledge stocks mindset and hold on, protect the knowledge, you know, avoid uh, sharing it. And I think that's going to be a challenge. Thank you. Could I just uh, oh, myself, brief, yeah, could I just briefly build on uh, that as well? That uh, yes, I, I certainly think that moving into this uh, new era or a new paradigm, we will need more ways of new, knowing. Um, and the indigenous or ancestral ways of seeing the world is very much resonating with what uh, John Fullerton just mentioned about living systems. To be in contact and be participating and to see the world as an interconnected whole, as a living system, that is, of course, very, very, a very, very valuable perspective today. And uh, some months ago, we had a large gathering on the Oak Island with representatives of indigenous people from all over the world trying to bring a dialogue be between uh, the industry, politics, and thinkers today with the indigenous communities. But I should also add to that that we shouldn't forget about also the pre-modern or the more religious or spiritual way, but more organized religious way of looking at the world. There are also perspectives there that we need to integrate. We need to keep the good parts of the modern perspective of science and reason and of human rights and medicine and all of that that we don't want to throw out, of course. But then also, and perhaps a little bit controversial, I would also argue that many of the postmodern insights that we have today around the importance of us to become aware of hidden power structures and the way that our human world is socially constructed are also valuable insights that we need to integrate. So there are many, many perspectives we need to integrate to come to this integral or holistic uh, view that Fullerton was mentioning. Okay, Hansaki. Okay, um, Jochen is back with me. So he wants to say something uh, because we were expecting a fourth guest, a German woman, Maya Goepels. Unfortunately, although she's the one who is coming from closest, uh, in the end, she's not with us. So I will let Jochen yeah. say something here. Hello, so I use that camera too. Yeah, Maya Goepel uh, wrote that book, uh, Unsere Welt Neu Denken, Thinking the World New. And she uh, is on number one uh, of the books uh, now in Germany with this book. It seems to be that she touched a real subject. She's one of the most important researchers on transformation. And she is also an advisor um, for the government. Unfortunately, we are trying all the time to reach her and may, she might have difficulties to connect with us. Nevertheless, um, she is uh, with us all the time because this has to be continued. What we're doing here since two days, and today is our last day, is anyway a process. So whenever Maya maybe joins, she can step in and we will connect. But I think now is a good moment, and thanks to the three speakers, maybe to, um, to Thomas and the two Johns, <laughs> that we open up the discussion uh, for a moment, because we have a couple of people in the chat rooms who are willing to ask direct questions or give comments. So let's use the time now. And if Maya joins us, she's most welcome, of course. So we move to Scott. Scott, can you see some raised hands? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so to... Ah, Gina. Oh. <laughs> Gina, please, you, you got the audio now. I will just um, open this part of the discussion up by saying how um, amazing it is. Now, this is my um, third World Human Forum. I was invited to the first, but was unable to make it. And I'm just um, so taken by um, the use of technology, the way in which you all brought this program together. And I just want to applaud you and thank you for not stopping um, the flow of the World Human Forum and bringing us all together to share ideas and share um, you know, inspirations and innovations. And um, I really just wanted to say thank you. Uh, I'm, I feel extremely privileged 
uh, to be here and to witness and to listen and to learn and to have access and the opportunity for us to gather in this way. And I think that um, through technology, we have found a new addition to how even when we come together physically, we can broaden. Because I also remember we, at one of the World Human Forums, we did a live viewing of uh, the March for Our Lives March, uh, when the young people in Florida were marching uh, against gun violence. And so I hear is another opportunity for us to collectively come together uh, in a new way. And I just wanted to thank you for, for bringing this forum to this space. Thank you, Gina. And obviously that brings passion into the conversation. And um, I think, uh, John uh, uh, Hagel, you, you believe very much that passion is important. And if I can judge from my own experience, uh, before I discovered my own passion for something, I was just an observer. And it is passion uh, that changed my life. In my case, it was uh, working for poor communities and poor children in the global south. And uh, it was that moment that changed everything. So maybe you want to comment on that while Scott is looking for questions. Christiana. Sure. Um, yeah, again, it's part of our, the research we've done around the changing in, in the world. And one of the big questions, I mean, everybody talks about the need for us to learn faster and lifelong learning and the world so rapidly changing. Very few people are talking about the motivation. Why would we ever want to learn faster and throughout our lives? That's a lot of time and effort that takes us out of our comfort zone. Why would we do that? The unstated assumption is that it's because of fear. If you don't learn, you're going to lose your job. You're going to be marginalized. Our view is actually the most effective, powerful form of motivation for learning is this uh, very specific form of passion that came from our research in environments where you see sustained extreme performance improvement. And we found that uh, in those environments, the participants had a specific form of passion that we call the passion of the explorer. And it had three components. One was these people were committed to a domain for a very long term and to making an increasing impact in that domain, not just being in it, but making an increasing impact. Secondly, they had what we call a questing disposition. They were excited by new and unexpected challenges. This was an opportunity to learn, to get to that next level of impact. And then third, they had a connecting disposition. When confronted with those challenges, their, big, their instinct immediately was, who can I connect with who can help me to learn how to get to a better answer faster? And those three coming together are extraordinarily powerful to drive learning and achieving more of our potential. And uh, we've come to believe that we all need to focus on really looking inside and, and discovering what is that passion that could motivate us if we don't already have it because until we have it, we're not going to learn as quickly as we need to. Jochen has so, so Here comes a question from um, Monica de Asuncao Carlos. Uh, to all, uh, what do you think will be the impact of artificial intelligence on, on university education? So who goes first here? I just, uh, I did respond actually that there's uh, one of my colleagues from Singularity University. Um, she has a, a company um, which uh, is called iris.ai and uh, Anita Scholl uh, Bread is her name. And it's a pretty incredible tool actually because what it does is it crawls university research from all around the world and it can aggregate that into these very meaningful kinds of knowledge based uh, searches. So uh, that's one of the biggest issues, of course, is you have uh, published research, which is usually behind a paywall uh, and is usually um, uh, something that uh, is challenging to, to, to just discover. So I think this is an incredible opportunity to use AI to discover uh, research that's relevant and may inspire just from synchronicity uh, those kinds of, of broad searches. Okay, thank you. There comes another question. Um, in which types of sectors and institutions the resistance to change 
is the most fierce? I think that's a very good question because resistance in change is a, a big problem. Who wants to answer that question? Uh, I talked about resistance to change. I, I believe that it's in all sectors and all institutions. Again, I'm going to generalize, but all of our institutions are driven by this model of scalable efficiency, and that model is very resistant to change. Anything that is uncertain, that could disrupt the, the well-laid processes we've laid out, no, get away. And I think that it's going to be, I don't, again, my... <laughs> My key advice is never underestimate the resistance to change. Because well, I know there. what you're talking about. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll jump in. I, I mean, I certainly agree, John, with that. I, I, I once described an institution as, um, as, as an institution only because it's good at not changing. Otherwise, it wouldn't be. <laughs> um, but I have to say, I do think there's one sector that is the worst um, because it's grounded in ideology more than institutions, and that is finance. Mm -hmm. and, and our belief that value is money and net present value is how we measure things in cost benefit analysis. We, we confuse costs with wrongs. Um, and, we, and that gets us to awarding the Nobel Prize to someone who, whose model says we should optimize toward three and a half degrees. So uh, leaving aside all of the bad behavior of Wall Street, just the ideology of Wall Street, which is reduce, reducing everything that we care about to money, um, and, and we've organized our society around this, uh, I think is, is probably the, um, the biggest obstacle. And, and believe me, I've been banging my head against it for 20 years. And if I was any good at it, we'd be in a different world. <laughs> okay. All could right. I just, could I just add? Well, one thing to, to this question as well, and that, that is that, yeah, we, we are certainly seeing a lot of pushback fr from a lot of different uh, institutions and uh, any institution that cannot reinvent themselves will of course be uh, very prone to uh, resistance. But we should also at the same time uh, not forget that if we are looking at these really fundamental societal transitions, and again, when we went from uh, the medieval way of organizing our world, the pre-modern world to modernity, it was many of the medieval institutions that did not uh, evolve, but was then just instead completely marginalized. So uh, uh, we might not have to change all these institutions, we might find ourselves in a situation in, in 10 or 20 years when many of our pillar institutions in today's society, like um, the university or like even the market, uh, might not be reinvented, but rather completely modularized. Well, thank you, Thomas. Um, there are a couple of people are very much interested. Uh, and so I put some questions together in one large question. Um, and it's about the global movement of these um, discussions we have in the last days. Um, what can we do to move fa forward faster together while the existing system, systems and structures are so firmly established and resistance against change? How to mobilize public and turn these ideas into a global movement? And how can the passionate doers get more attention and space in the mainstream of society? And before I give you over to answer, I can also express that turning a traditional music festival like the Ludwigsburg Festival into a festival for the arts, democracy, and sustainability was not so easy than it sounds like once we are sitting together and doing that things. I had to convince many people about that, and I had resistance. But in the end, it turns out that the whole society of Ludwigsburg starts to wake up and understand no, this is not a festival for the classic freaks. This is something for the whole society. And if other festivals or other art institutions, powerful, more powerful even than our small festival, would follow that road, then it would become mainstream. And when I met Amina J. Mohamed, the Vice Secretary General of United Nations in January in New York, she said, we did the, we did the compass, we did the, the roadmap with the SDGs here, with the Sustainable Development Goals, but, we need the arts to put people in motion. 
emotionally. And I think that makes sense. Maybe you want to resonate on that because Thomas was explicitly speaking about Goethe and Schiller. I mean, this is the, 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 the philosophy behind what we are doing, I think. But I'm happy to John, hear- John is raising- John Haig, yeah, please go ahead. No, no, I have been studying movements throughout history around the world uh, for many decades now. And one of the things that I've, I've come to believe is that the successful movements uh, have two attributes. One is they focus on what I call an opportunity-based narrative. They are framing an opportunity that's inspiring and that will motivate people to overcome fear and move together, come together to achieve some inspiring opportunity. And it's opportunity, not threat. I think a lot of movements are driven by threats. And um, in, in the movements that have succeeded, it's opportunity. And the other piece is the movements have been organized in, uh, have a very specific organizational structure. It's a cellular structure. They typically are organized into small units of five to 15 people who are not just coming together to talk. They're coming together with a commitment to action, to making a difference. They're holding each other accountable. They're supporting each other when you run into frustrations and then connecting those cells into a broader network so the movement can scale. But those two together are extremely powerful and I believe can drive fundamental change. In, in our case, uh, this is our deep belief that what is needed here uh, is some way to connect. And this is our idea with Delphi and the World Human Forum. Um, it's true that I say sometimes that being the novel, being the omphalos, is certainly not the most sexy part of the body. So we don't pretend to anything more than to create this web. Because we have been working now uh, scouting around for the last uh, four years, actually. And every day we discover new initiatives. Every day we get more inspiration, whether it is at the level of education, at the uh, level of uh, sustainability in the arts. There are people everywhere. Our, com our belief is that we are many more than what we think. But there are too many people out there who don't dare really go to the step further and say, I'm Yes, I can do it too. And yesterday our education session was amazing because it was finished with this young student. She's only 20 something, Autumn Gupta. And she said, thank you to my teachers at the University of Southern California for allowing me to understand that I can be a change maker. I, who am only 22. And we hear that story from children now. So uh, there is, there is a big movement out there. And if we can bring this together and show uh, that, uh, that we, uh, maybe there is already, we will reach the critical mass much quicker than what we think. And I think we should because time is running out and time is also running out for our discussion because it's 1834 and normally it should be my German friend who should look at the time, but he doesn't. So <laughs> <That's> I, <true. laughs> I, I look at the time and I say, thank you very, very, very much. Um, we will soon close this first journey, Echo of Delphi in Ludwigsburg. Uh, and we thank you because you were our last guests. And we will move uh, now on to our friends in Paris, our friends in Delphi, and uh, show you some more uh, videos. And then, of course, we will say goodbye with the last movement of the Fifth Symphony of Beethoven, which, if I understand Jochen well, is in C major. So that's the transition. Four exactly. C's and <laughs> major for Beethoven. But before that, I think we have a few other people to visit. So exactly. thank you all very much. And let's stay connected, please. Yeah. Thank you so much, thank everybody. You. And I, I really want to uh, also thank you all participants here especially i hope um, that maya will uh, be with us next year maybe in delphi we will invite her and um, maybe yeah it fits to close here uh, that we had one woman missing but don mullen said to all of us that major changes can only happen if we have really women in leadership um, because with this male domination, half functioning, it's only half functioning, it's what he says. And we must work for reform in this new age of alignment. 
that's uh, from a man, Don Marlon, to all of us other men and also to the women, of course. But I, th I also believe that um, uh, a huge global movement can start if men take action in gender equality. It's one of the sustainable development goals. And I think that is really on us, those who have the, the privilege to have the power, more power than the other half of the world population. And I think it's really time for this global social movement men taking action for gender equality. I think, thank you, Don Mullen, to express that. And I think he speaks out of 